have six minutes and 32 seconds. We got a shot clock in there. Okay. Here and there. I did it. I did it more when I was doing it. Got a job teaching.
Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Montclair. My name is Michael Gilch. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And I'm filling in as music director this week as Marcus is a little under the weather. Uh, a few notes for those of you who are here in the sanctuary with us. Please uh, keep your cell phones on silent or turn them on silent if they aren't already and off of the UUCM Wi-Fi uh, to help with our bandwidth for streaming online. And hello to those of you who are joining us live streaming. Our reopening task force is continuing to evaluate COVID protocols based on the most recent data. And here are our updated safety guidelines for worshiping in person. We ask that all who can be vaccinated and we encourage distancing in our well-ventilated sanctuary. A space is set aside in the front of the sanctuary for families with unvaccinated children. Congregational singing and choir singing is permitted with masks on. Attendees are welcome to sing, but we ask that masks be worn while singing, except for our hymn leaders. Otherwise, masks are now optional during the service. We are reserving the narthex for those who wish to attend the service without increasing their risk of exposure. Uh, and speaking of our hymn leaders, uh, today we have Charles Laughlin, helping lead us in song, and Julia Crafton, who will also be sharing one of her original songs for our anthem today. Uh, and we have Glenn Rombo on guitar as well. So please stand and join us in our opening hymn, number 347, Gather the Spirit.
beautiful How could anyone ever tell you You were less than whole How could anyone fail to notice That your lighting is a miracle How deeply you're connected to my soul Whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever age, ability, history, identity, gender, or sexual orientation, you are welcome to bring your full self here. I am Charles Laughlin. My pronouns are he, him, or they. Grounded in faith, we come together to nurture the soul, inspire hope, and bring into being a more just and loving world. In today's service, Ghana Hilton and Reverend Anya will share stories and reflect on the impact of heritage, on the way wisdom, pain, beauty, and more can travel generational paths through families. And after today's service, we have in-person Connection Cafe. Coffee, snacks, and fellowship can be found through this door in Fletcher Hall. Our virtual Connection Cafe returns on the third Sunday. Please see your This Week at UUCM bulletin for other important information. And please note that today's Connection Cafe activity of a sing-along has been postponed until May 29th. This will be an outdoor adventure in joy and celebration through communal singing. There is more for me, as I was just told. <laughs> Ours is a covenantal community, and we share a common covenant, a commitment to come together in service to the beloved community. So let's light our chalice as our chalice lighting affirmation is shared. Let us open our senses to take in the beauty. Let us open our minds to learn what is true and let us open our hearts to love one another. I'll just start with a little bit of gratitude to Charles Laughlin, who's filling in last minute as liturgist. Thank you so much, Charles. And also to the Wolf family, who has put together our beautiful chancel for us throughout the whole month of May. Thank you so much. So good morning, I'm Reverend Anya Samler Michael, she, her, hers, joined in the telling of our time for all ages with Ghana Hilton, today's co-worship leader, and Charles Laughlin, today's liturgist. Surprise, Charles. Surprise. <laughs> this is a favorite story by Paulo Coelho called The Perfect Heart. 
A young man was standing in the middle of town proclaiming, I have the most beautiful heart in the whole valley. The most beautiful. And indeed, it was perfect. There was not a mark or a flaw in it. But an old man appeared at the front of the crowd and said, Your heart is not nearly as beautiful as mine. The crowd and the young man looked at the old man's heart. It was beating strongly, but it was full of scars. It had places where pieces had been removed and other pieces put in, but they didn't fit quite right. You must be joking. I mean, comparing your heart with mine, mine is perfect. And yours, well, well it's a mess of scars and tears. Yes, yours is perfect looking, but I would never trade with you. You see, every scar represents a person to whom I have given my love. I tear out a piece of my heart and give it to them. And often, they give me a piece of their heart, which fits into the empty space, but not exactly. Sometimes, I have given pieces of my heart away, and the other person hasn't returned a piece of their heart to me. These are the empty gouges. Giving love is taking a chance. Although these gouges are painful, they stay open, reminding me of the love I have for these people too. And I hope someday they may return and fill the space I have waiting. So now, do you see what true beauty is? The young man stood silently, with tears running down his cheeks. He walked up to the old man, reached into his perfect, young, and beautiful heart, and ripped a piece out. He offered it to the old man. The old man took his offering, placed it in his heart, and then took a piece from his old, scarred heart and placed it in the wound in the young man's heart. It fit, but not perfectly. Well, it's not perfect anymore, but it's more beautiful than ever, since love from your heart now flows into mine. It's not perfect anymore, but it's more beautiful than ever, because love from your heart now flows into mine. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Silke Springorum, she, her, hers, and I'm a member of the pastoral care team at our congregation. Called to find depth in our days and discover reverence in this hour, we seek a gentle meditation, a focused reflection, an ardent prayer, each as we are called and yet all together. And we enter into this space by hearing the lamentations, the requests, and the remembrances of our community. Let us hear one another to heal one another. Jill Watnick lights a candle of release and comfort for her father, Harry Gurken, who passed away on Friday morning. We light this candle for our war-torn world and all the people caught up in the terror and loss of violence in Yemen, in Ukraine, and beyond. We light this candle for Sophia Roman Luna, who celebrated her communion at St. Cassian's Church. We are so proud of you, Sophia, and respect your engagement of multiple faith traditions. 
we light this candle to welcome home Kitty and David Bessie. 362 days and, and 10,500 miles on the seas later, they have returned to New Jersey and to our congregation. Grateful, awed, and still rocking from the boat. Welcome home, world travelers. Happy Mother's Day to Renee and all the other mothers who are missing their child today. With love from Ariana and Renee. We light this candle for Christian Turek, who has, a, who has a new knee and a road of recovery before him. May he find rest and comfort in the coming weeks. And we light this final candle for the joys and sorrows that are deeply felt but have not been spoken aloud. May we hold this silence as this silence holds us. May our listening inspire acts of love. Please continue with me now in the spirit of prayer or intention. Our prayer for today is shaped in relation to an affirmation written by the Reverend Leah Angiri. On Mother's Day, let us mark how beautiful and complex it can be to mother and to be mothered. To those who have mothered, we thank you. To those who rejoice in the work, the role, the presence of mothering and mothers, we celebrate with you. To those who have felt the depth of the struggle, we witness you. To those who experience loss through infertility, abortion, miscarriage, adoption, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who have lost their mothers, we grieve with you. To those who have endured abuse at the hands of their mothers, we acknowledge you. To those who experience pain at the marking of this day, we witness you. To those who are moms across the gender spectrum, we honor you. To those who are single moms, step moms, foster moms, adoptive moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. Now may we breathe deeply together and know the complexity of this day, moving gently through it and finding some of what we need. May it be so, and amen. Our prayer response is 1047 in your teal books, Nada te turbe. Feel welcome to find that and sing along. We'll remain seated for the prayer response. Oh 
those that seek God shall never go wanting. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten God. Nothing can frighten, nada te turbe, when we join together in our work of care and contribution. 80% of what you offer will care for our congregation and 20% will support our April and May recipient, Good Success Academies. The Good Success Academies organization, founded and led by the Reverend Alan Shelton of Wachung Presbyterian Church in Bloomfield, works to empower youth to succeed in school, work, and life with a focus on college readiness, work readiness, career readiness, and world readiness. Our gifts will provide sponsorship of the Summer Entrepreneurial Project. Ushers, please come forward. You can text UUCM plate and your amount to 73256 to give. You can mail us a check with Integrity House in the memo or simply place your gift in the offering basket. Your gifts are worthy and they are all received with love. Our reading is the poem Glossolalia by Eugenia Lay. Glossolalia is an expression of worship spoken in another unknown language, such as speaking in tongues. Before I share the poem, I'd like to read the author's own introduction. Lay shares, I write this poem from a place of fear. The fear of passing down my past, its traumas to my child. What surprised me was that while I believed I was trying to express these anxieties, the poem showed me that I was actually asking for something. Hope, perhaps. A healed future. A child more resilient than I. 
When another poet suggested the title Glossolalia, it occurred to me that as I wrote this poem, my spirit must have been praying. My baby brandishes a wooden knife meant to have a wooden shallot as he hollers his newest word, knife. Look at my son, flashing his dagger, jamming it into plush animals. Knife, knife, look at him, oblivious to the weapons littering his lineage, or God forbid, possessed by them. Can the babies planted in the dirt of our bodies absorb the torments buried there? My gentle, watchful child wants all the knives. But some days, everywhere blue, the bear blue, the bells blue, the car, the cup, the light. I marvel at my son who marvels at the sky, blue, blue, no matter how gray the bully of clouds. And this is all I want. Look at my son laughing at the rain. Look how he prods the window with his knife, insisting we cut up the storm, demanding the blue back into view. This is a song I wrote. Um, it's for anyone remembering someone today. Your beautiful eyes put the stars and I to shame. Trust in soul, I never knew you were in pain You started forgetting your sickness was to blame But it had no right to take your memories away She was losing you Cause you had always been there when I needed you Not anymore Now it's too late to say I love you I miss you every day I had so much left to tell you So much left to say Just a baby, you wrote me a letter It's a piece of your love that I can keep with me forever But as I read it now, I have questions that need answers to ask was then and now it's never your son he came 
came crying and said you were gone I was not allowed to see you He said I was too young to understand So much left to tell you, so much left to say. Beautiful memories you gave me to remember you by. And if I could turn back time, I'd want one more chance. To say. And then the people came and they were dressed in black Telling stories about your past And then the ashes were gone, buried forever But I promise you we'll be remembered Now it's too late to say So much left to tell you, so much left to say Beautiful memories you gave me to remember you by And if I could turn back time, I'd want one more chance to say the little girl who didn't realize she was losing you has finally had the chance to say goodbye thank you I think that was a mic drop. <laughs> Julia, that was beautiful. The one person that I hate to have to preach right after. Ghana, I should have made you go first. In fact, I think that my words are over there, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, switch with me. But you still go first. <laughs> huh. My words aren't over here, Ghana. My words are over here. Hmm. Let's see. Michael, please play something for us. <laughs> there we go. We're both going to be here. Want hold, me to hold take on. this? Just hold it. What you did to me? <laughs> Before I begin, I just want to share we're missing Rev Scott today. He is on vacation celebrating in New Orleans. Bless him, getting some time away, but he misses all of you and wishes he could be here. So, this is a story about generations, about what is passed down passed through, passed on, and this is a story about what is transformed. This is a story about hope. My parents are savers, and their parents before them, most of them were savers. We are a people who put up food. We are a people of extra freezers. Anybody else out there? My grandmother, yes. Po I see you pointing at your mom, Rebecca. <laughs> 
My grandmother, Babci, Babci is the Polish name for grandmother, never made a single plate of gwumpkis in her whole life. There were always three, one to eat, two for the freezer. My dad, when I go home, he takes me to the pantry first whenever I visit. Our tour begins with the brightly colored peppers that he has just pickled, or the sauerkraut, or the beets, or the tomatoes. In the summer when I visit, he will send me off with a gallon of gooseberries, three gallons of blueberries and some wine berries that we foraged in the street. And I had best return with enough jams to put away for the winter. We are not only a people who save, we are a people who stockpile. There's family lore of my uncle David, who had found my grandmother's store, and I mean store, like a store full of Christmas cookies in the freezer, and eating them a handful a day over three months, finished them off before the first holiday guests arrived. It's family lore because it is both a beautiful illustration of David's character. I so love David. And it is a story of abject horror, at least for my grandmother. This was my heritage, to save, to stockpile. And I do, I can, I freeze, I make veggie stock from the trimmings. But it was also my lot to receive all of the extra that my relatives held onto, all that they rarely ever used, and that they had to just let go of in the end. My people did not have incredible wealth, but they did have some special items, and I got them. I got the china, the silver, the odd orange sherry glasses the crocs for making the kraut, some from my great-great-grandmother's kitchen. And I held them at bay for a long time, in boxes, preserving, protecting, as I had learned to do. I held them at bay. This was my generational heritage, a people who saved, who kept things at arm's distance. Also things like hugs, like emotions, like that rich, deep, difficult truth that runs through all of us, but for so many remains hidden, stockpiled, for that distant time in the future that we might then need it a people who were terrified of vulnerability, terrified of breaking things, of not having enough, of not being enough. I held all of this stuff at bay until I didn't. I've chipped, I've broken nearly half of the china, truly. We eat with the silver. It tarnishes. I haven't cracked a single one of those odd orange sherry glasses, but I sure hope to. I love that they, that my generations of ancestors taught me to save, but I don't want to save myself from the messiness, from the chipped, the raw edges, like that heart from our time for all ages. I don't want to save myself from the broken places because they are the places where love has and will enter. So why not eat all the good stuff long before the relatives arrive for Christmas? Why not risk? Why not relish? I put away relish, too. This is a story about generations, about what is passed down, passed through, 
passed on. And this is a story about is what, what is transformed. This is a story about hope. And you're probably going to be hungry by the time Reverend Anya and I stop talking. There's a story told in many cultures about a family meal, and I'm sure many of you have heard it before. A young girl watches her mother prepare the holiday roast that they make every year. First by cutting off each end before she places it in a pot, then adding seasonings and onions and potatoes and so forth. Why'd you cut off the ends and throw them away? Her mother said, that's the way my older sister taught me how to do it. At the next holiday gathering, the young lady and her mother watched this big sis prepare the holiday roast. And the young girl asked again, Aunt Deborah, why'd you cut off the ends and throw them away? Aunt Deborah said, you know, I don't know. That's the way our mother taught us how to do it. Let me ask her. Grandma later arrived at the gathering, and the three ladies asked her about the holiday roast. Oh, she said, when I taught your aunt and your mom how to cook, we were poor, and the only pot I had was tiny. The holiday roast wouldn't fit, so I had to cut the edges off. Well, <laughs> the holiday roast wouldn't fit into the old pot. <laughs> We have mindlessly been doing the same thing that she did and he did, not even knowing why. Not even having the same circumstance. Never asking the explanation. Just mirroring previous generations because that's how we do it. That's how we learned it. I'd like to claim that story as my own, but it's not, even though I understand it very well. Not as the granddaughter being the first to question, although I have been in that thankless position more times than I'd care to discuss. And not as the grandmother who finally sheds light on the familial tradition. No, I relate to that poor, perfectly good holiday roast. There are many parts of my culture and identity completely cut off when my great-great-great-great relatives were kidnapped from Africa and enslaved in the Americas. Culture and identity this country still gets uncomfortable around when I try to reclaim it. There are parts of my genetics completely cut off when my mother and father decided to divorce and he left, never to be seen again. And I didn't know my paternal side for over 30 years. There are parts of my peace of mind completely chopped off when my family chose to hide important medical history, hoping we could just chop that troop off so we could fit it into the old pot of what a normal family looks like. But I'm here to tell you there is no normal, just like there is no perfect. We have been doing dumb, hurtful, unnecessary, and sometimes brutal damage because no one questioned it, generation to generation. Under the guise of ignorance, of hurt feelings, cultural norms, and my personal favorite, tradition. Your patriarchal grandfather, the whispers about your daddy's other children, or your uncle's roommate, your racist grandma, Instead of passing it down through you, fortifying your childhood trauma and passing it to your own children, stop, question, pivot. You are the key to critical thinking and making better decisions. You are the catalyst for open and honest conversations around the imperfections in all of our families. No generation was perfect. Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Us, Gen Them. Stop perpetuating generational awkwardness for no good reason. It's not easy being the trailblazer, but it is so worth it. Be brave enough to ask why. Be strong enough to find a better way to hear a buried truth, to fix an unhealed trauma, to right a wrong, 
because the point was never how grandma made the holiday roast. Y'all are getting that part, right? The point was the family, right? Sharing love, sharing history, sharing recipes, sharing respect, making things work with the tools and know-how they had at the time. That is the center of the story. There is the hope. So please, stop cutting the holiday roast or just buy a bigger pot. So this is a story about generations and about what is passed down, passed through, passed on. And this is a story about hope. My mother had a hell of a childhood. I mean, she had hell at times. She had hell for childhood. And there are times when that childhood looms over her present. She left it to the past, but it didn't fully leave her. It is the way with trauma, but she did, she did learn to dance with it. Some of my favorite memories of my mom when I was young are of her dancing. An oldie on the radio and my mom twisting and shimmying and doing something like the mashed potato. She'd taken ballet and later made money go-go dancing. Go-go dancing. And into her late 60s, she cut a rug at weddings, just immaculate. Through the arthritis now, she still even does some chair dancing. <laughs> so Jews pray, many Jews pray, shuckling. And it's a lot like dancing, bowing back and forth and side to side. My mom's Jewish, and this practice can be traced back to at least the 8th century. It was said of Rabbi Akiva that when he prayed, he would start in one corner and end up in another, because all of his kneeling and bowing back and forth moved him across the room. In Hasidic lore, shuckling is an expression of the soul's desire to abandon the body and reunite with its source, similar to a flame shaking back and forth as if to free itself from the wick. My mom worked so hard to free herself from all she endured. And I see my mom, my Jewish mom, doing some of this while dancing. I wonder if her grandfather, the rabbi, also shuckled while praying. I surprised myself once by take, taking a seminary course on vocal articulation. We were studying chanting, and I was alone practicing toning. You go, a or O. You hold it for a long time, the note. And before the rational awareness of what I was doing, I found myself shuckling back and forth. And it felt fantastic. I felt alive, caught up in everything, caught up in my generations. I was just moving, I was praying, and I was one with all of those who had come before. I didn't think that I had the dance gene, but it has me. My mom, she can't help herself. I took ballet for a year and dropped it. I thought I dropped it for life. I'm just back from New Orleans. Let me tell you, it has me. That is the city that never sleeps and never stops dancing, right? I think I learned from my mom the blessing of bodily expression, that it is an incredible freedom from the taut strings of trauma. 
Late at night when I couldn't sleep, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, there was dancing. Then it was dancing to rage against the machine. Anybody else? Any, it, it, you talked about generations. Are there any of my generation out there? <laughs> All right. And that dancing, I have to admit, it was kind of like praying. The generations spill from us like that. And sometimes it feels holy. Will you reflect with me? How does the story of your ancestors continue and transform in you? How does the story of your ancestors continue and transform in you? Our closing song is, There's a River Flowing in My Soul. You'll find this in your Teal Hymnals, 1007. means that we are aware that we did not make ourselves, that the line stretches all the way back, perhaps to God or to the holy, we remember them. Because it is an easy thing to forget that we are not the first to suffer, rebel, fight, love, and die because the grace with which we embrace life in spite of the pain, the sorrows, is always a measure of what has gone before. And it was Kendall Gibbons who said, who are these children that we are mindful of them? They are the heirs of the work that we have done and are doing. The next generation onto whom the torch of our tradition shall pass from our hands. 
They shall build upon the foundations that we lay. They are the yet unwritten chapter in the story of our faith. This being the case, what do we promise unto them? We pledge them challenge, skepticism of the too easy answer, and a pointing towards the ever open road. We pledge them roots, a tradition to pass on to their children, a place to come home to. This is a story about generations. This is a story about hope. Amen. to our greeters. Thank you all so much and have a happy Mother's Day.
I'm gonna wait till I can play. I am the very model of a modern major general. I'm almost there. <laughs> I am my Thank you. 